everyone. Once again, great to be with you this week. Uh, I'm going to be continuing through our Kingdom Callings and we're on to a new one. This time I want to talk to you about the call upon us as God's people, as the Gateway Church, to be a people of grace and peace. Uh, let me read out to you the statement that forms part of our Kingdom commitments relating to grace and peace. It says this, uh, we are committed to be a church family who embody the grace and peace of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ in our relations with all people. Now the measure of grace and peace that we can give to others is wholly dependent upon the grace and peace that we ourselves have received from God and Jesus Christ. And in the coming weeks I'm going to talk about offering grace and peace to others but today I want to begin with talking about God's grace and his peacemaking towards us because it's very important that we have it in the right order. I want to begin by reminding you the story of Tracy, who was a lady connected in some way to our church. Uh, Tracy lives up in Dumfries and Galloway, about three hours away from where we are here in Newcastle. And she uh, was feeling a drawing from the Lord. She didn't really know where to go to church and she looked online. And online on Facebook, she found uh, someone who was a member of our church who helped her, who was given her some counsel in the things of God. And then she found out that we were uh, going to be on the streets preaching in Newcastle. And one Saturday, she travelled all the way down from Dumfries and Galloway to Northumberland Street in Newcastle to come and hear us preach. Uh, I had the privilege of being able to go for a coffee with her and spending half an hour with her uh, and just being able to share the gospel um, and help her understand it. She then went back home and uh, it turns out that she was looking for a church up there and contacted us for a little bit of help and through relationships that we had with the BGEA, the Billy Graham uh, Evangelistic Association, we were able to find her a church up there. And it's not been easy for her. Uh, it's been some difficulties within her family in her coming to the Lord. But what I've seen uh, as I went up to witness her baptism not long ago was that she is just a, a testimony of God's grace, of God's drawing. Uh, the way he drew her, the way he um, gave her understanding of where she should go and what she should do in order that she could hear the gospel and she could respond to the gospel. It's just a wonderful testimony. And as I was meditating upon what God, done in, God had done in her life up at her baptism, it reminded me of how God had drawn me in my life. Uh, you know, when you look back on your life and you see how God has worked, not through just your good choices, but also your bad choices, you see God's grace at work. And so I became a Christian through uh, a guy uh, called Lindsay and, and, and his brother Adam and I met Lindsay when I was at university in Aberystwyth and I only met Lindsay because when I went to university in Aberystwyth I was at the Freshers Fair and I was deciding what sport I was going to play and uh, I had the choice of playing football or American football or some other sports and in the end I chose to play lacrosse I'd never played it before, but I decided to give something new a try. And I met Lindsay whilst playing on the lacrosse team. And I used to reflect back and think, wow, if I'd chosen football instead of lacrosse, maybe God would have directed me to a, a Christian on the football team. Who knows? Uh, but it seems that if I didn't choose to play lacrosse, I probably wouldn't have met Lindsay. Uh, so I seen God working even through that choice, which doesn't feel like kind of a, a sacred thing, which sport I play, but the Lord worked through it. And then I thought, well, you know, I had to be in Aberystwyth in order to choose to play lacrosse for the university. And I only ended up in Aberystwyth because there was one day where I was on a train going to Huddersfield. And whilst I was on the train, I met a girl called Laura who was on the train and um, she chose to give me her number and uh, we stayed in touch and I quite liked her and uh, I ended up going to Aberystwyth because she was there. I could have gone to Northumbria University or Aberystwyth and I chosen at first to go to Northumbria and on the very last day uh, when I was at work and uh, it was the last day to kind of change your mind, something in me just said no go to Aberystwyth and uh, I didn't know God at this point obviously but I chose to go there so if I hadn't have gone there 
If I hadn't have met her on the train, I wouldn't have played lacrosse. I wouldn't have met Lindsay. And then I thought, you know, I wouldn't have been on that train to where I met Laura um, if I wasn't actually going to see another girl on the train, a girl called Linda, who lived in Huddersfield. Uh, and I'd met Linda whilst I was on holiday in Benidorm. And I was only on holiday in Benidorm because uh, we me and some friends had turned up to the airport without anywhere to go. We wanted to go on holiday. We packed our cases. We went to the airport. And in those days, they had a travel agent in the airport. And we said, where have you got? And they said, we've got Tenerife or we've got Benidorm. And we just decided we're going to Benidorm. And we landed up in this hotel where I met this girl called Linda who lived in Huddersfield who I stayed in touch with. And I could go on and on, but you get the point I'm making. Through these choices, which certainly weren't godly choices, uh, if you read between the lines, you see that God was working to get me to a place where I could hear the gospel. And he led me to a place where at the age of 25, I encountered Jesus Christ. He overlooked my sinful choices and he worked in my surroundings to enable me to know him. Do you know that the Bible says that God moves the boundaries of the nations, that people might reach out and find him? You know, God is working in all of our lives that we might reach out and that we might find him. Maybe you don't know him and you're listening to this. It's not a coincidence that you're listening to this. Uh, God is working in your life to draw you that you might find him. Maybe you do already know him. Well, God is working in this that you might know him even more. And he's working through other circumstances in your life because his will for all of us is that we possess abundant life in him even in spite of our choices to ignore his commands that is his desire for us he's committed to making peace with us and he's committed to offer us grace every day that we live is a day of grace god could come back christ could come back and he could judge the world right now but today is a day of grace the only way any of us can receive what God wants to give us is through his grace. And so that's the key word I want to talk to you about today, that word grace. It's a simple word and it means undeserved favour. It means God giving us something that we don't deserve. The message of Jesus, the message of the gospel, is a message of grace. It's the story of God offering you something when he doesn't have to giving you something when you certainly don't deserve it. Let me just read a scripture that will help explain this a little bit more. Uh, Titus chapter 2, 11 to 15. This is what it says. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now, do you see how it begins there in verse 11? It says, God's grace appeared. So the grace of God, therefore, is not a, just a concept. It's not a force but the grace of God is a person. God's grace appeared, offering salvation to all people, teaching them to say no to ungodliness and to live upright, uh, to, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. In Jesus, God's grace delivers us from ungodliness. It trains us to live righteously. Uh, a former pastor of mine had this little saying, he used to say that salvation is not just pie in the sky when you die, but it's steak on the plate while you wait. Uh, Jesus is the gift of grace from God, the Father that transforms us in the here and now. Uh, a while ago, I was meditating upon the grace of God and the Lord gave me like an acrostic for the word grace to explain how God's grace comes to us in Jesus. And I've shared this when I've been out evangelizing 
on the streets because it's a very simple message. Uh, I've also shared it in, in another gathering at the Connect gathering, but I want to teach this to you in our church too because I believe it explains the grace of God towards you in a way that we can all understand and importantly in a way that we can remember. So each letter of that word grace, G-R-A-C-E, stands for a dimension of the grace of God towards you in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to give you each one. We'll begin with G. So G, God's grace in Jesus Christ gives us revelation of who God is and what God is like. It gives us revelation of God. Colossians 1.15 says that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Colossians 2.9 says for in Christ the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Now the fact God sent his son to us is grace in and of itself. Uh, Israel, the, the people to which Jesus was born into, he came first and foremost for the lost sheep of Israel. Israel had gone astray. God had sent prophets to Israel, one after the other, and they stoned the prophets. Pagan nations were all around worshipping false gods. We in our day, even now, all like sheep have gone astray. The Bible says we have turned each one to their own way. We don't naturally follow the ways of God. We naturally follow our own ways. We are sheep without a shepherd. God, who has made himself known through the invisible, the um, he's made his invisible attributes known through what he's created, uh, could have left us to judgment. We deserve nothing more than God's wrath because although we know he exists, we don't go after him. But he came in a form that we could understand. He came in Christ to draw us. The Bible says in the book of, of John, in the Gospel of John, the word became flesh. So God speaks through Jesus' life and he makes a way for ordinary people like us to understand him. You know, so in sending Jesus, God took away all doubt about who he is and what he's like. You know, today you've got 4,200 religions uh, or thereabouts claiming to possess the truth. The question is, how do we know what's true about God? Because each one proclaims a slightly different way. Well, we see through prophecy in the Bible in the Old Testament, over 300 Old Testament predictions fulfilled in Jesus' life. Do you know that if only nine of those were fulfilled, the, the odds of that happening is one to the power of 1,017? You say, what's that number like? It's, it's a very, very long number. Trust me, it's a mathematical impossibility. Never mind over 300 of those being fulfilled in his life. We see Jesus coming and doing miracles which turn doubters into believers and the greatest miracle of those of course being the resurrection which put the seal upon Jesus as being the son of God and the evidence is there. We know the resurrection is true. I was sitting with somebody at Christianity Explored the other week who was asking about the resurrection and I was saying that there's even a guy on, on YouTube and you can look him up. I, I think his name is Jay Warner. Um, and if you look on YouTube, this guy used to be like a CIA agent and he was a detective and he set out as an atheist to disprove the resurrection because he was used to looking at evidence and he got into it and he studied it, looking to disprove it. And he actually found the um, anthropological evidence, the historical evidence, uh, the theological evidence, it was all there to prove that Jesus was in fact resurrected. And so he gave his life to Christ. I'll explain more about that at Easter. But we also see that through the growth of the early church and through the apostles, some of whom were once enemies of Christ, giving their life to Christ and proclaiming Christ to the point of death is proof that Jesus was risen from the dead. You know, people say today, when you go out and you proclaim that they should turn to God, they say, if God exists, why doesn't God show himself to me? 
And the answer to that is God has shown himself and God has shown himself in the most powerful and clear way possible by taking on human flesh and walking among us on this earth. He hasn't just sent a message uh, into the minds of messengers. He has done that, but he hasn't just done that. He hasn't just sent his word down on tablets from heaven. He's done that, but he hasn't just done that. He's literally taken on flesh so that human beings can understand him. That is grace to us because it opens our blind eyes to see his goodness and his kindness. And the Bible says that it's his kindness which leads to repentance. So we have his kindness in the fact that he's given us revelation of who he is in his son, Jesus. That's the G. The R of grace is that he removes the penalty of sin. The Bible, and by the way, he also removes the power of sin. But I just want to focus on the fact he removes the penalty of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Every time we sin, we are storing up wages for ourselves. And if we receive the wages that we deserve for our work, it's death. If we're honest, we've all sinned and we're all ashamed of the sins that we've committed. When I go out and preach on the streets, and I know other brothers do this as well, I always give the the uh, projector test, which is, you know, if your life was displayed upon a big projector, everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever done, and you knew that your family were going to come around and sit and watch this, not just the things you've committed that, that are public, but all of the private things, and even to the depths of your thoughts, the good and the bad, would you want your family to come and watch that? Because many people think that they're going to be right with God because their good is going to outweigh their bad. So that's a little test. Would you want your family to watch both the good and bad? And if we're honest, the answer is no, because we know the depths of our sin and we know that our good certainly doesn't outweigh our bad. And we know also that God is a holy God. He's a just God. And being a just God, he has to punish wrongdoing. A just judge cannot overlook sin. But Jesus voluntarily came and went to the cross. He endured beating, he endured torture, he endured lies, mocking and execution. And he did that, that you might be set free and that you might not receive the wages that you deserve. Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe because you and me, we owe a debt that we cannot pay. When I first understood the gospel, I got the revelation of who God was in Jesus Christ And I understood that Jesus died on the cross that I might be forgiven of my sins. And I put my faith in him. It was like a backpack of weights was lifted off my shoulders. A backpack that I didn't know I was carrying around. The burden was removed and I was lighter. You know, in the Psalms, uh, King David says that his body was decaying under the weight of guilt and shame when he didn't confess his sins before the Lord and receive forgiveness. Um, When we carrying around the weight of our sins when we're carrying around the 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 understanding that um that that our sin is storing up wages for death it can even impact us physically david said it even made him ill jesus came he said not for those who are well jesus came for the sick jesus came not to call the righteous but he came to call sinners to repentance He came to call the people who know they need forgiveness. That is grace for you and for me. He he, he who knew no sin, he became sin for us, the Bible says, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's grace. That is undeserved favour. We have a lady on Christianity Explored at the moment. Uh, I think I referenced it before. I called it CE. <laughs> That's Christianity Explored. It's a course that I do with people on a Sunday morning who are looking into the faith and who've got questions. And uh, one of the weeks we do, the fourth week, we do it on the cross. We teach people about the cross and why Jesus had to go to the cross and what the cross means. And I asked the, the people on the course for their reflections on the cross. And she responded by saying that, I don't think it's fair that somebody else has to be sacrificed for my sins. And I explained to her and I said, you know, it isn't fair. But here's the great thing. 
he wasn't pushed into it and God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself God chose voluntarily to take on flesh and to suffer that you might live so he doesn't want you to live in guilt he doesn't want you to live in shame he wants you to live with thanksgiving and gratitude he wants you to see the depths of his love towards you that you might love him and that is grace our ability to love him comes through grace and the response has to be gratitude it has to be thankfulness it has to be praise so that's the r of grace he removes our sins the a of grace he gives us access into the kingdom of god uh, when i first heard the gospel with my friend lindsay that i told you about before he invited me down to a christian conference where there were thousands of christians and in that place where i heard the gospel i encountered a reality that i'd never seen before and that reality was thousands of people living with peace joy and righteousness the love that they had for one another and the love that they had for me was just incredible i remember thinking man this is heaven on earth the whole world should be like this and only my friends at home could get a taste of what this is like they wouldn't want anything else and i didn't realize at the time but i was experiencing another kingdom upon this earth a kingdom i never seen before and it was the kingdom of light it was the kingdom of god and i wanted to be in that kingdom but what i didn't realize at that time was that you don't get into that kingdom by attending the meeting you don't get into that kingdom by signing up you get in by the lord changing your heart and that's what had happened to all of those people they weren't just nicer people than me they were people who'd had their hearts changed through faith in jesus and the Bible says that in Ezekiel 36, 26. It's a promise where God says, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to give you a new spirit because the heart of the human problem, as we know, is the problem of the human heart. But when you believe in Jesus, Jesus himself comes and lives inside of you by the spirit. He changes your heart. He changes your desires. It's a supernatural work of God. It's a work of his grace. Before I was in the kingdom, uh, lust as you, you'll have heard a little bit from the story i shared before uh, lust but also idolatry also witchcraft uh, self-righteousness anger irritability jealousy fornication drunkenness gossip slander all of those things were part of my life and i had no power to stop those things because that was normal to me that was my world and it was the world around me i didn't know any different i didn't know another world or another kingdom existed but when i trusted in jesus my heart changed overnight uh, my language changed i stopped swearing overnight i just couldn't do it anymore uh, my demeanor changed yes there's been things in my life which have been cleansed out progressively things of the world uh, but some major things did change straight away and all of that the stuff that changed straight away and the stuff that changed over time that's god's grace he not only changes you positionally uh, jesus not only gives you access positionally before the father in heaven when you trust in him uh, but he cleanses you along the way he changes the way you live he makes you holy as he is holy now don't get me wrong even now i still have struggles i've got struggles in my life i've been diagnosed with four anxiety disorders i've got obsessive compulsive disorder uh, something that i struggle with every day but the spirit by god's grace is progressively cleansing me and helping me overcome i wouldn't say i've fully overcome yet but i'm overcoming i don't deserve that grace i don't deserve that enabling power but jesus is grace to me the more i focus on him the more grace i have and the more grace uh, that he gives me to overcome so that's a he gives me access into that kingdom of light that kingdom of god that kingdom of power c the c in grace he gives us certainty in the face of death you know as i get older uh, I see more and more the fragility of life. I, I see it in my own life and in my own body. Uh, but as people I know get older, and 
as in, in some pass away, like I more pass away than I'm used to. I see it in their lives as well. The, the Bible says our life is like a, a vapor, like a mist. Uh, we're here one minute and we're gone the next minute. And I know that when we think about death, we, we'd like to think we're going to be in heaven. The issue we have is that no sin can dwell with God. Only the sinless can make it into heaven. Uh, but through faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we're joined to him. We're joined to the righteous one. We're joined to the blameless one. Uh, we're joined to the one who has committed no sin. And the Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places. You know, it's like visiting a exclusive club where you have no right to get in there, where it's only for special people. And the doorman sees you and the doorman's going to reject you. But the owner of the club, his son comes along, he hears you're there and he comes outside into the queue and he takes you out of the queue and he walks you in. And just as the doorman's about to stop you, the son says, actually, he's with me. He's coming in. And the son takes you in and he goes and sits you in the VIP section where his father is the owner is seated. Now, you don't deserve that. You've got no right to be there. But because you know the owner's son, you're brought in through him. You're brought in on the basis of his authority. You get to sit in the best seat because you know him. You know, heaven is like that. It's God's home. It's God's place of ownership. And you can only get in through the son. The Bible says that Satan stands there before God and he accuses you. Satan is your accuser, the accuser of the brethren. But for those who've put their faith in Jesus, the son stands there as our advocate. He speaks on our behalf. He defends us on our behalf. And so this even today is God's grace to us. He's standing on our behalf today. You don't have to be unsure about your destiny about where you're going. You don't have to approach death with fear and uncertainty because in Christ, you can have assurance. That's God's grace for you in Jesus. You don't get that in any other religion. If you speak to any person who believes in any other faith system and you say, are you going to heaven? They will say this. They'll say, I hope so. I hope God has mercy on me. Do you know that we can know whether or not we're going to be in heaven. We can know, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of Jesus' work. If we put our faith in him, we have certainty that although we die, we will live. Although our body goes into the ground, we will be raised with him. What a blessing that is to be able to walk through this life with that certainty. You only get that through the grace of God. Okay, so what's the E? In grace, I wonder if you can guess what the E is. G-R-A-C-E. The E is eternal life. Of course it is. It's eternal life. Eternal life refers to the longevity of life. It refers to immortality. It refers to life beyond this life. But it's so much more than that. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief, meaning the devil, comes only to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Then he said in John 17, 3, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, who you have sent. Now, do you know that you have a purpose in this life? Everyone's seeking for a purpose in life. Everybody is seeking for significance. People look for it in others. They look for it in relationships. I used to do that. I used to look for significance in relationships. They look for it in position. I used to do that as well, in notoriety. They look for it in power, in authority. Uh, by the way, I'm guilty of all of these. Uh, they look for it in money, in materialism. But all of those things, you can have all of them. They never fulfill that's why most of the people who possess all of those things are depressed, stressed, lonely, and at the end of themselves. Um, there was one person, I think it was 
Jim Carrey, the actor, who said that he, he wished that everybody could experience having everything they ever wanted like he did, because then they would realise that uh, it doesn't fulfil you. It's, 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 it's nothing. You're still lacking. Uh, God created you with the purpose of knowing him. God created you with the purpose of loving him. God created you with the purpose of worshipping him. And the eternal life that Jesus Christ gives you is reconciliation. It's peace with the God who created you. The Bible says outside of Christ we're enemies of God. We have enmity with God. But in Christ we have peace. The Prince of Peace gives us peace. His grace adopts us into his family. His grace uh, puts sandals on our feet, a ring on our finger and a robe on our back like the story of the prodigal son, which is a, a symbol that you not only belong to the family, but you're given the best seat in the family. His grace restores us to be the person we've been created to be, to be in the place we've been created to reside. Every single person on this planet is a worshipper. We worship what we give our thoughts to, what we give our time to, what we give our attention to, what we give our energy to, what we give our money to. We worship the things that we serve. What is it that you worship? Who do you worship? Because you've been made to worship God. You've been made to love him, to know him and to worship him. God has given you grace in his son Jesus Christ so that you can be restored to the only one who will satisfy the longings of your soul. Your soul longs to be connected with him. When King David came out of the place of sin and was reconciled to God, he declared of God, he said, God, your, your love is better than life. He said, I, I want to dwell with you all the days of my life. That's what I want to do. And you know, he was mocked by his brothers. It says that his mother's sons, that's his brothers, they, they mocked him, they laughed at him, they ridiculed him. He said he'd become a reproach amongst them because he so loved the Lord. Because their souls hadn't been satisfied. All they could do was mock. But his soul was satisfied in God. He was experiencing eternal life. Not just hope beyond this life. He was experiencing life today. Satisfied in the love of God. Which is found only in Christ. Some of us may still be bound in worshipping things other than God. Some of us might be bound in behaviours that are contrary to God's will. The answer for you isn't to try harder. It isn't just to try and stop doing those things. The answer is to receive God's grace that he gives you in Jesus. And to the measure you receive his grace in Jesus is to the measure that you'll be set free of the things which bind you. That grace has been given to you in abundance it's offered to you in abundance all you need to do is to receive it and to fix your eyes upon it and to walk in it next time i'm going to talk about how the grace of god that's given to us works in and through our lives in our relationships within the world but for this week i just want to give you the time to meditate upon his grace towards you G-R-A-C-E, gives us revelation of what God's like, removes our sin, gives us access into the kingdom of God, gives us certainty in the face of death, and he gives us eternal life. How wonderful is our God that he gives us all of those things in his son, Jesus. We don't deserve it, but he's given it to us. Hallelujah. Let's just pray and give him thanks uh, as we ponder on these things. Please join me in prayer. Father, we are so undeserving of all that you've given us. We deserve nothing but rejection, wrath, 
fury and judgment. Lord, because you've created us, you've created this world, and we, like sheep, have gone astray. Uh, we've followed the ways of Satan in elevating ourselves and wanting to become like you and wanting to be the ruler of our own worlds. But Lord, you've not left us to our own devices and you've not left us to what we deserve, but you've come to rescue us in Christ. And we are so thankful. Thank you that you've loved us first. Thank you that whilst we were still sinners, you loved us and you died for us. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Thank you that in Jesus, we can be called a friend of God. That's astonishing. Thank you that in Jesus, we are adopted into the family. Thank you that in Jesus, we are blameless and righteous. Thank you that in Jesus, we are in your kingdom. Thank you that in Jesus, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far our sin is removed from us. Thank you that in Jesus, we're no longer slaves to the fear of death, but we have life. Thank you that in Jesus, we have that knowledge of God, that knowing of you, that intimacy with you that relationship with you where we know every day that you are in us and you are with us i pray lord for myself and for all my brothers and sisters that we would walk in your grace that we would walk in a greater revelation that the life we live is a life in the grace of god and it's this grace which saves us it's this grace which delivers us it's this grace which enables us to repent and to turn towards you. Wherever we are on the journey, Father, I pray that this week, as we think about these things and we move our hearts towards you because of your grace, Lord, that you would help us receive more, that we might walk more in the fullness of God. We bless you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy thinking about the grace of God this week and enjoy walking in it. See you soon. Mm -hmm.